Good afternoon. This afternoon and evening, I'm speaking with Luke McBain, who is doing research on leadership from the perspective of Jungian psychology and alchemy. And I found one of Luke's diagrams very interesting. It's partially based on the secret of the golden flower. And so I'd like for Luke to explain what it is he's doing, and then we can have a discussion. Go ahead, Luke. Well, Skip, thanks, thanks for having me today and giving me this opportunity. And I'm, I'm really curious to, to hear what you and, and also your viewers you have, to, have to add to that discussion, because I you know, consider myself more like right now in a learning phase of my life. I can only say I'm not a therapist, um, primarily in the Middle East of all places. So I was living for 10 years near Jerusalem, which has not to do too much <laughs> with, uh, with the research at hand, but just just as a side note. And mm -hmm. in my in my last 10 years of working as a manager, I, I, I somehow became dissatisfied with current leadership theories, which I reviewed uh, in, in, in the quest to do a PhD on the subject of leadership. But I got stuck 10 years ago on the PhD, and it didn't progress. I was, you know, very unhappy in what what I had found out, I didn't really go on. So I said, okay, forget academics, forget uh, everything else. I'm just going to work, make money, and that's it. Everybody seems to have some sort of opinion about what is a good leader, what's a bad leader. And then and I heard a, a lecture by Jordan Peterson. A quant MBA in terms of being all statistics by different names, or was it a, a standard MBA that includes behavioral science and things? I would say it was like a standard MBA focusing on strategic management, so um, economics, behavioral science, uh, also some leadership, some some financial things, and on and so on and so forth. So, I would argue, yeah, it's it's a good way how to dissect reality into bits and pieces to make it like manageable, basically. Right? Mm -hmm. So. Um, and then I, I studied a lot of also because I thought I'd go on to make a PhD on leadership and I studied all the leadership um, theories and I was became sort of like slightly fascinated by it because there seemed to be something very important revolving around the fact of values. Okay, and I'm saying that because it's sort of in, it's, it's important for the whole story uh, because I studied before that I studied actually literature and drama and all that and of course in the Aristotelian um, philosophy um, catharsis and values are of prime importance so you know when when you have a narrative basically the narrative serves to transport values right from sure from from one person to the next from a narrative to the to the subject watching and so on and so forth so I always found that interesting that there is sort of like in leadership values and uh, and, and and the values which are transported through narrative I found there what there was some some relation in that, but it never, I never clicked. <laughs> you were saying, I'd like to make a case for Jordan Peterson, so go ahead and make your case. Yeah, because he says that, or he, he, what he writes is basically that when we talk about values, it's not the, the abstract, rational system of values, which is often described in management literature, which means, okay, hardworking, uh, believing in a higher good, you know, it's, it's, all, it's all very rational. Peterson says, no, these are emotional values, so values which you, which you feel something about. So that, that helps you guide you through your life. So if you feel strongly about something, that's what you will decide to do. And for leadership, that's extremely important. So whatever you feel strongly about, people will see that in you. And if you act according to what you feel, people see you as authentic and are more willing to believe in what you say and what you would like to for them to do so that's how i got into the field of jungian studies basically and that's where i i'm making a new proposal in terms of leadership is that basically first of all leaders can only be persuasive if they represent who they are and if they represent what they feel and not just what they rational believe rationally believe to be right, you know, right. and of course that's 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 my starting point. So I say, I think social science, behavior studies, does not cut it when it comes to leading other people to another place, basically, also to a better place. 
Right, because um, behavioral studies yeah. is all on the re on, so, so, on the logo so, so. size. Luke, behavioral studies is all over on the uh, logo side also. It, it's just saying, if I do this, then you'll do this. That's logic. Okay, and then you, you put statistics on it, which right. says, if I do this ten times, you'll do X seven times type stuff. Okay, so that's all on the rational side. But I, I agree with you entirely, and I think that one way we could think about it, because I always ran a company based on it being my family, okay, and knowing that if a person walks out the door from me, either because I fired him or because he's left because he doesn't like me, I've lost the value of what I've put into that person. They take their head with them when they leave. And so, first of all, you have to cultivate people as you would cultivate a child. And with the expectation that, like a child, they're also going to make mistakes. Um, and one of the things that I frequently mention is that one question I always ask people uh, when I was interviewing them for employment was, what is the biggest mistake you ever made? And the reason for that is that if you haven't made a big mistake, you haven't, either you haven't done anything or you're lying to me, one of the two. And so if, you've, if they'll own up to a big mistake, then that shows a level of maturity and um, acknowledgement that one has to grow and, and make mistakes. And I used to tell them, if you're not making a mistake every day, you're not trying hard enough. Why? Because we learn from mistakes and the company gets stronger when you make mistakes and when you have an experience of making mistakes. I mean, Dr. Jung's point about psychology is you don't learn anything uh, without experience. You know, you can't talk somebody into learning something about psychology. They understand it when they have that experience. And so if someone makes a mistake, they've had the, mis the experience of making a mistake. Hopefully they won't make the same one again. And hopefully the next time they're around somebody that's going to make the same mistake, they'll say, oh, this happened to me and maybe you oughtn't, oughtn't do it that way. And I don't have to be there when they do that because they've learned. You know, I'll give you another example. I, I spent 23 years in the U.S. Marines. I served in Vietnam. You know, one of the critical things that young leaders need to learn, I mean, first of all, when we train a young leader at Officer Candidate School, we set them on a pedestal. We, we show them a platoon commander who's usually a first lieutenant or a, a second lieutenant even, maybe, and he's put on a pedestal in front of the officer candidates. But, and so when they graduate and they become a second lieutenant, then they might get to be a little inflated. But the reality is that it isn't the lieutenants that make a unit run. It's the sergeants who have, had, who have experience, and they're the guys that make it happen in the field. And if they're not respectful of that sergeant, then as soon as the shooting starts, that lieutenant's going to have a bullet in the back of his head, not in the front. <laughs> and so, so the, the lieutenant, fortunately, I grew up in the military, so I already knew that, the, you know, in, on the shop floor, it's the foreman that runs the show. It's not the, it's not the suit back in the office, right? It's the foreman that runs the show. And so the sergeants are the, are the foremen in the, in the military. And so if you don't know that and respect that and let them do their task, which is hands-on fathering of young Marines, <laughs> then you're just getting away in the way of the process. And so you have to treat it like a family where you're the father and you're trying to bring along young people, your family members, to 
be able to face the world one way or another. And if you do that, uh, for example, the way our president has done it, where he just throws people out constantly, um, you know, you get a reputation <laughs> and, and, and people don't want to follow you after that. And if you, uh, you know, I was listening to Jordan Peterson this morning and, you know, he was saying you get the, you know, you have to have a, an experience of trustworthiness. People need to trust you in order to let you play the game. If you're going to play any game with someone, they have to know you're not going to cheat. And, and if, if they know that you by reputation cheat, then they're not going to invite you to play the game. And, um, you know, and that's, that's what we're seeing now at, at the political level, where somehow this man got through to our top leadership, and yet he's been doing it by cheating all the way along. And so he's gotten away with it because he kept it as a very small group. But now he's in the big game, <laughs> the big game of American politics, and the other politicians don't really want to invite him in, I think, is, is what he's experiencing. I, I, think, I think your experience from the, um, from the military is really, really, really very interesting. And um, uh, because what, I, what I'm sort of like, and I'd like to hear your point on that, is what I found out is, for example, that leadership theory and training leaders, the factor of fear never emerges. And I found that very strange because, to be honest, the, what I see as the primal function of a leader is to lead the group into the unknown. Absolutely. So that's what I think, that's what I think the leader does. So he mitigates between the future and the present, and between the unknown and the known, right? So and he translates Precisely. whatever comes from that chaotic environment into something which is tangible and which others can act on. And that's sure. why they respect that person because perhaps not everybody can 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 function at that level of being, right? So right. Well, maybe they could, but they don't know how. So I think that's the primal function of a, of a leader to be able to translate from the unknown to the known, and to and to be able to do that, a leader has to manage his or her own fear of the unknown Precisely. because there is always fear of the unknown that it's it's impossible not to be afraid that's that's part of the human condition to be afraid of the unknown and so i am just shocked at leadership theory telling me or not even speaking about for example fear and how to deal with your own fear which is your greatest asset and your greatest ally and we when dealing with the unknown and i think in the military especially uh, you know when you're under such dangerous circumstances you know fear is either your greatest enemy or your greatest ally. It depends how you manage your own fear and your level of fear. But yeah. uh, I, I'm, I'm sure you're also aware that, that that nobody would deny saying, "Well, I'm never afraid." I, that that person who says, "I'm never afraid" or "I'm not afraid of the unknown," is somebody who is mentally not quite right. Right. And and, and, and everybody has everyone has for fear. Just that and, reason for saying that. And you I want mean, to rely on working with it. Right. You want to rely on the experience of your leaders. Okay. And so there's a very there was a very interesting scene in the movie A Bridge Too Far. Mm. Uh, in that movie ha, did you see it, Luke? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so there's a very interesting scene. There's two soldiers and they're sitting on their cots right before uh, a battle and the younger man is saying to the older man I want you to guarantee me that I won't die and the older man who's played by James Kahn uh, says well I can't guarantee you that and he says no Eddie I want you to guarantee me that I won't die and so Eddie says okay I guarantee you and so then the two of them put their tunics on and it turns out Eddie is a staff sergeant and the man he was talking to is a, was a captain and <laughs> the one who wanted the guarantee right and so the captain then gets shot and he, Eddie fulfills his obligation by getting by 
saving this man's life, which may or may not have been the right thing to do in the circumstance. But uh, nonetheless, it was the the inexperienced man asking the experienced man to get him through some fearful situation. But that's how it always works. And, you know, people, for example, dread going to Marine Corps basic training or officer candidate school. They think, oh, it's going to be awful and so on. But the thing is, once you know that the drill instructors cannot hit you, you know, when you're standing at attention or you're doing something, the only fear is whether you won't measure up, but it's not a fear of being physically attacked. But what, if you can physically measure up, then you can make it. And, and so I remember thinking four weeks into my own uh, first experience with it, because I went through twice, once as a candidate and once as a platoon commander. And in my candidate time through, I remember being on a hill talking to my bunkmate one day and saying, you know, this is everything I always hoped the Boy Scouts would be. <laughs> but it wasn't. <laughs> you know, maybe the Boy Scouts changed over the years, but... The, the, the film uh, A Bridge Too Far is really an interesting example because you could even see that from so many other perspectives that you know, leadership is is basically this bridge building into the future, isn't it? I mean, Surely. that's what leaders should be doing. And, and problem building solving. Building a bridge for their people. Yeah. And the, right. yeah, the, yeah, showing a pathway and being that pathway and communicating that to people. And then they arrive at the other side and they say, how did he do that? Like, we're all here and we're all safe and he built us this bridge. But unfortunately, in the bridge too far, they built a bridge, they planned a bridge too many, which is the bridge in Arnheim, and right. they sent all these people to their deaths because the leadership was poor. They, they made the wrong, they made a misjudgment, basically. They weren't, they weren't, uh, they made some really bad mistakes in that film. So it's, it's, I think war movies actually have a lot to offer when it comes to leadership because it shows people in very extreme conditions um, having to make very, very difficult choices. Truly, and interesting that artists are able to talk about which that's, that's that's extremely interesting, isn't it? That they're able to tell something true about very extreme circumstances, although they might never have themselves been in a war. And mm -hmm. um, I believe, you know, coming back to narrative, that is opening up a pathway from from within themselves to the outside world about some very true aspects of you know how we experience life. Um, so yes, and I think that leaders, if you want to be a good leader, you should be able to, to discover your own pathway into the future. And, Surely. um, I think it's possible. I, I, th I think there are models to, to, to do that, but why your, your channel is also so interesting is you have to also like, like you, you have to be able to first discover who you are to be able to open up that pathway and right and that for others and that's the fundamental um, one of the fundamental ideas if you're not aware of your own um i don't think to yourself capture that um that information yeah one of the fundamental ideas that is in jungian psychology i assume you ran into it is the idea of understanding what your self is, okay? What, exactly. What your, uh, he also calls it the God image. So you can, you can basically say uh, it is God. And in fact, Jung, uh, in a letter to a pastor, finally admitted that from his perspective, God is the unconscious and the collective unconscious. So God within you, and then also God and society are both unconscious. And so the fundamental idea is that you have to let that driving force that really rules your life emerge. And you are going to make mistakes, and you are going to uh, fail, and you have to trust that that process 
that individuation process, as he calls it, is going to take you to the best place you can get to in your life. And so uh, individuation would be every oak tree is an oak tree, but every oak tree is different. And every oak tree knows how to become an oak tree. Well, every human being knows how to become this perfect human being, regardless of the slings and arrows of life. It knows how to do that. And the way it does that is by having a defeat. Okay, as long as you're going forward and there are no defeats, okay, then you can go on to stardom. Then you can become our current president. You know, there's no defeats because you you control the money and you just fire anybody that uh, doesn't agree with you. And so, yeah, you can ultimately buy the presidency. Does it get you happiness? Questionable. Okay, but the, po but the point is that... Um, the fundamental idea for a leadership perspective is that you have to build your ego, okay, from a Jungian perspective of what ego is, which is different from the self. And most people think of self as ego or arrogance, but it's the opposite in Jungian psychology. So you have to build a strong ego so that you can face the slings and arrows of life. And there will be some. We all fail someplace along the line and so the idea is a cycle which we call in Jungian psychology or I call in Jungian psych psychology the the Job archetype. And the Job archetype is contest, you try to do something, defeat, you fail, lamentation, you lament about that defeat and you lick your wounds psychologically, you heal your wounds and then you're reborn into the next thing. Now if you're meant to be some great thing then you might be still reborn in the same incarnation but if you're meant to be something else based on where who yourself is then you're going to be born into something new and so uh, the reason we're having this conversation is um, Jungian psychology and what I'm doing now is one of my rebirths and uh, I've had some phenomenal successes going up you know I've been de defeated by bigger and bigger bad people <laughs> I won't I won't use it I won't use the customary term but or I've been defeated by circumstance like you know I wanted to be a general officer in the Marine Corps but I slipped and fell on the ice and broke my leg in uniform and so the Marine Corps had to fix me but that was the end of my career that was the last thing I did in my career and so whether that was an act of God or an act of stupidity or just an act of um, not paying attention to the ice on the parking lot, no one will ever know. So I'll say it's an act of God. And it's, it's telling me that that's not the path for me. And so I broke my leg. I certainly had to lament about it because it took six months to heal and then I struggled it with it for 28 years and then I had to have the ankle replaced and so I've, I've suffered from it all along the line but uh, it put me on a different path and that path led me to uh, start a company which failed okay and which failed a second time and ultimately it succeeded with a different set of investors and reached uh, a public offering, <laughs> okay? Oh. And, and that's a long story, but, uh, and then I retired from that company quite fairly with my partners, and three years later I lost my life savings in the, in the crash in 2008. And so I lost everything and I failed again. And so then there was a lamentation about that uh, and 
that kind of led me into uh, Jung's work and uh, why I got into it. But the but the point I'm trying to raise from a from a business point of view is that this Job archetype of failing, lamenting about the failure, being reborn, trying again, and every time you fail, you try again. And if you think about your life, it it happened all the way along the line. That's how you learn as a child. And so you learn what your father and mother won't, will tolerate and what they won't, and you lament about those things, and you uh, follow the rules as long as you're under their roof and but then you have your own ideas about how to live your life and maybe you're right and maybe you're wrong but each time you fail and each time you go through that job archetype contest defeat lamentation rebirth you strengthen your ego so that you can face the next trial okay and That's I absolutely agree. I just I just need to turn on the light here because I'm getting okay. it's getting a little bit dark in here. So okay, yeah, I'm just giving it just just to give myself. There. I'm starting to look a little more like a ghost than there you go. <laughs> That's better. <laughs> um, I I just wanted to comment on that because I think it's so important, and um, it also strikes me as very strange that, for example, leaders are not taught this specific cycle you are talking about, because that's exactly also what I'm talking about. My theory is that this cycle of, of death and uh, sort of suffering and of death and resurrection and rebirth and victory basically over death um, is such an important part of life that I'm surprised that more, not more leaders are actually not explicitly taught that as a technique, first of all, are not prepared for this. And third of all, I mean, they have, to, they have to come to terms. It's, of course, it's a religious belief, like the whole passion of Christ is part of the, is, is that, you know, to Surely. overcome death. But it goes so much further, as you say. I mean, we experience these cycles uh, several times in a lifetime already. So, and your example of a bridge too far, I mean, why does he in the end then promise him, I'm going to promise you that? I mean, that promise... Is, 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 is figuratively and literal, isn't it? Like a, a good leader should actually say, you'll be fine. You yes. will conquer death. So you can see it from a spiritual perspective and you can see it from a very pragmatic perspective. So as a leader, sure. if you go into a, a battle or even if you go into, let's say, a new venture or build up a new business, you've got to tell your people, you'll be fine. I promise you, you yeah. will be okay. You will come out the other side better stronger, whatever, and I'm going to promise you that in your hand, and you've got to believe in that. So how are you going to believe in that if you haven't experienced this, if you haven't been taught that principle? I, it's sort of, I, I'm just baffled by the fact that leadership theory says nothing about that, although it's so important to lead others, to, 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 to communicate that to others, and this, this security, this sense of security, you will be okay. I know that. Right. Well, I... Yeah. I know why and how it happened in the United States, and it the, it's, can be laid at the feet of Milton Friedman, uh, who was Nobel Prize winner for economics, and therefore everybody bowed down to his idea, and his idea was that everything could be decided based on the bottom line. And so I remember still in my uh, MBA program, which was in the late 70s, we talked about three groups of interest, right? Those shareholders, the managers, and the employees. And they're three, so they're those three interest groups. But somehow that got converted by the statistical method into bottom line and do whatever you have to do to get the bottom line right in this quarter. And without thinking at all about what the consequences of that are. And so I remember even in the early 80s when I was working for a large international company that had 32 profit centers around the world, 16 of them in countries outside the United States. And I remember watching one of the managers who was 
constantly arguing about the transfer pricing model and about how much he was going to sell his product to another one in the overall organization, to another one of the internal profit centers. And the problem is that doesn't help the company at all. That would that might help his bottom line at the cost of his brother, right? <laughs> and, uh, that wasn't a very good way to run a business. We have to somehow teach people that common sense uh, has to rule over uh, over statistic and numbers sometimes. And, you know, it's not that I'm against profit. I'm all for profit, but you don't get to that if, if you don't pay attention to the people that you work right. for. And, you know, in my, in my case, and I, I've been through some pretty severe financial difficulties because of the crash. Two years ago, I couldn't afford to find an auto or to purchase even a used automobile. And it so happened, and this, this would have been in December of 2017, uh, that an, an employee of mine from all the way back in the late 90s, so 20 years earlier, was coming through town and he invited me and two of my colleagues who were in the management of our company at that time out to dinner. It was Christmas time and we went out to dinner with our families and he pulled me aside and he gave me a Christmas card and in it was a check for $5,000, which was exactly what I needed to get an automobile. And then I was reminded by one of my colleagues that 15 years earlier, uh, this young man, he was an Indian young man, he was probably in his late 20s at that time, and he was just newlywed and he wanted to buy a condo in my town here. And so I gave him a check for $5,000 out of my own pocket, and I... I just forgot about it. I did, I never even, you know, I, I never said he had to pay me back or anything else. I said, you know, good luck to you. And, and that was the start of his career, basically. And it made him strong in his wife's eyes. And he had two fine sons who, at this dinner two years ago, his son is now graduating from high school, ready to go to college. You know, there was no, there was no check. There was, or there was a check in 2002 or whenever this happened, but, but there was no, um, no promissory note and no expectation of ever being paid back. And yet he held that implicit debt in his psyche. And it came back to me at just the time in my life when I needed it. I have a similar situation going now where I have a partner uh, overseas. Even And I sent him a check for $50,000 one time and saved his company. And I've done a few other things for him since then. I mean, pretty big things. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> things that he, was, he hadn't been able to do himself. Now it seems that it's coming back to me. And all of that is done by strings that have nothing to do with a piece of paper or signing anything in blood or anything like that. It's only based on a relationship between two men. And, you know, that's, since I've always treated it as a family, I'm, I'm being treated like a father figure by those people later on. It's saving me as, as we save our parents when they get old and can't, can't take care of themselves. We take care of our parents. Well, these young men are taking care of me. And there, you know, there's nothing that says that they have to. It's, it's only that, you know, they feel that bond. And so that bond is, um, something that you can't, you know, 
the, the President of the United States has never developed any such bond with anyone except maybe Roger Stone, perhaps, but... <laughs> <laughs> you know, no. when one wonders whether he would even throw his his sons and daughter under the bus. <laughs> yeah, he's a, he's an interesting he's an interesting phenomena, socially speaking, very interesting phenomena, yeah. to say the least. Um, you know, as as somebody living in Germany, I'm not sure if I'm qualified to comment on on U.S. politics, but of course, everybody in Europe watches this very closely, and I'm I sure. watch a lot of. Uh, you know, views on, on YouTube, and and he's a very very interesting phenomena, like this tr this trickster type uh, personality. Who, I mean, I think one commentator once said, you know, after after his presidency, we will wake up and we will wonder what has happened. Like yeah. it'll, it'll be like it'll be like a, a show, basically, like a front, and things will have gone on while he was doing all his you know sh trickery and soap opery and all that. Yep. And then people will say, well, what happened in that time period? What was actually happening? All that is meaningless, you know, all that discussion about him and his family and, and what he said or tweeted or didn't tweet and Russia and back and forth. It's, it's just a show. It's, it's like a big um, burlesque show, basically. Yeah, it's and, a burlesque uh, show. Yeah, it's that's a burlesque it. show. And what's, what's really underneath happening that basically the, 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 all the politics is still continuing. The Republican Party is still working. They're still implementing all their policies and so on and so forth like nobody seems to notice that or seem to give anything anymore for that because right. you have the showman in front of them sure. making these smokes and mirror sure. smoke and mirror basically all the time so yeah, yeah i don't know I'm, yeah but I, I i got a comment on something else which 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 strikes me as uh really profound is that your your ability to empathize with people and to connect to them and to feel for other people that's 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 i felt that as as very profound because i don't think everybody has that quality yeah you know, sadly to, to, to go out on a limb yeah, for sad. others yeah well that's yeah that is that's that's the case yeah that is the case and I, i'm not sure if i could say that even of myself and say did i ever do those things which you did and i'm not sure i would be able to answer that question or do a, you know, give an example which was similar to your example. 